Hey, my tech friends, thanks for stopping by. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Let's continue to grow this channel. Hope you guys enjoy this video. So by popular request, I've been asked to do a video on Windows X Lite. And that's specifically what we're going to do here is we're going to do an installation of Windows X Lite, which is a build based off of Windows 11. Once we get through the installation, we'll do our typical quick check, take a look around the operating system, see how the UI actually works. And then we'll put it to the test by running a scan on it with the Nessus scanner to see what comes back. Stay tuned. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to say is during the installation process, this initial screen is way too busy. Uh, to me, this looks like there's just too much going on. I'm, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it, but aesthetically from somebody like me as a professional, uh, I, I know that generally speaking, when you do an installation or you do any kind of configuration in any Windows-based operating system, the more beautiful the colors are, the slower the OS usually is because there's more rendering that needs to take place from your video card to actually render the, the display. So to me, having you know text-based or very plain colors um, in a 16 color type of configuration would make more sense because it would keep the overall size of the operating system smaller. Now that being said, the installation itself to install this package was 3.6 gigs zipped. So since we are doing this based off of security, and since I'm not going to install any additional security functions into the operating system, I think the best place for us to start off with here is with Defender turned on on our actual uh, Windows 11 build. So let's go through the build. So it all looks pretty standard so far. Let's kick this off at the next screen. Okay guys, so we just rebooted. Uh, no additional questions or requests. It never asked for a key or anything like that. Uh, let's continue on and see what the rest of the menus show. Okay, so the operating system just booted. We got through the splash. Oh, we're rebooting. Hold on. I must have spoke too soon. Okay, so we're in the process of booting back up after the system rebooted on the initial logon. So I will say that graphically, once you get into the operating system, it does look very nice. I like the theme pack that they have on this particular system. Start menu is actually very nice. It's in the wrong place. I mean, for me, I would I would like it over here, but or you know, if we're gonna put it in the middle, could we have it like the Apple one or Linux? But at any rate, it, it does look good. Everything seems to flow pretty nicely. I don't see any like latency or bizarre like locational things, click problems. Let's take a look to see what we actually have on here. Other than the, you know, the theme pack, it all looks pretty standard so far. I guess there's the x -Lite tools. We'll have to take a look at these tools and see specifically what's in here. Let's go into this PC. I don't know if you guys could see this, but uh, that that's straight up amazing. That means the operating system for Windows 11 installed on this machine is only taking 5.2 gigs in size, which is straight up incredible when we take into consideration that we also have a page file on this drive. So uh, in reality, this is probably the smallest operating system or Microsoft operating system that's modern that I've installed on anything in a real long time. Color me impressed by that. Okay, so let's take a look at some other stuff here. Let's uh, right click on the start menu. And let's go to system. And let's take a look to see specifically what we are running. All right, so we are on 23H2. So we're 5.2 gigs in size on 23H2, which is just straight up amazing. I'm impressed. 
I'm impressed with the size. Uh, quite frankly, even if I had to use this offline and never connect to the internet, so far this is the best version of Windows 11 that I've seen that's not, you know, Microsoft's version of Windows 11. At least aesthetically and the size of it are, are both very impressive. All right, let's get down into the nitty gritty of the operating system. Let's take a look at the firewall configuration first on this thing. Actually, because the firewall takes a little longer to dig through, let's go to uh, add remove programs first. Let's go to the control panel. So I'm, I'm just gonna go to, uh, I guess start here and command prompt and do run as administrator. So I like that too, that it's actually clear. So that's something that we've had really in the Linux terminal. Uh, terminal environment for probably uh, 20 years, but it's nice that somebody actually added that to Microsoft so you can see through it. That's pretty sweet. Uh, let's do um, control panel and see what we got going on in here. So it looks like we just have the standard, right? So we have remote desktop connections turned on, which again, I'm not sure why Windows has done this, but it appears that that's the norm now is that we have remote desktop services configured as an application, as an afterthought that's installed on these machines, um, I guess through the Microsoft Store, but yeah, we have remote desktop services. Start all back is basically our UI, what changes our actual start menu service uh, to look like this. From what I understand, that is the reason why we have the start menu here and not over here, that we can't change it with this particular application. Now, I don't know if that's been fixed in later versions that's currently running. I just know from previous versions that that required the start menu to be in the middle in order for it to work correctly for whatever reason. Um, I do like the way it looks, so I, I would just leave it. And I also like the fact that I don't lose my right click on my menu options on the start button, which is super important if you're a systems engineer or a systems admin is the ability to access the sub-menus off the start menu. So things like um, Classic Shell, um, they, they don't allow you to do that. There is no right-click. If you right-click on the start menu, you get a sub-menu that allows you to exit cla Classic Shell. Uh, and the other issue here is something that I don't know. I'll have to look. And I'm, I'm guessing the uh, Tenable scan will tell us is whether or not the version that's installed on this, does that have the Log4j vulnerability because Classic Shell does, but Open Shell does not. So if you're running Open Shell, you're fine. But if you're running Classic Shell, uh, upgrade that to Open Shell or replace it with the Start All Back application, uh, presumably. We'll see again in the in the Tenable scan. But those two sh should replace the Log4j vulnerability found in Classic Shell. So at any rate, let's uh, let's continue on the process here. Let's take a look at the uh, Windows features to see if there's anything funky or anything additional installed here. So from what it looks like, it looks like we do have some customizations in here. For one, we're not running .NET Framework 3.5, which supports 2.0 and 3.0. And quite frankly, from a security standpoint, I can understand why you don't want to run it. And for the most part, most applications are going to require 4.x at this point, unless you're running legacy stuff, in which case you'd have to install the .NET 3.5 framework on that. But that would also increase the size of the operating system. Right now at 5.2 gigs, you can't really complain that we're missing certain functions of the OS because the majority of people are probably not going to need it anyway. As far as the additional stuff that we have in here, we have uh, media features. So we have the legacy media player here. That's pretty sweet. Uh, I like the ability to run the legacy media player. That's awesome. Uh, some other things, we have print to PDF. Again, if we're going to use this for printing, great. Print and document services is semi-installed. So we have internet printing client enabled. Um, Remote, di di uh, wow. Remote differential compression API support. Again, great. SMB direct, so that's 2.0, 3.0, but it doesn't have 1.0 enabled. That's fine. PowerShell 2.0, great. And then the work folders client configuration. So basically allows you to uh, synchronize files. It's something you would use probably for like OneDrive. Uh, so everything in here looks good. I don't see anything really so far that, that looks like uh, questionable. Let's drop back, let's change it over to our small icons, and let's go into the Defender Firewall and take a look at the uh, configuration in here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into the Allow Apps and Features and take a look and see what we have specifically in here.
So this is interesting because even this person who put together this particular operating system doesn't have this remote assistance crap turned on in the public configuration, which is smart. Whoever did this is smart. And that's, to me, that's, that's something that you look for when you see this because a lot of the time when you see these things that are just out of the box configured, they're red flags as to security related concerns in the operating system. So the fact that the person who put this together had the mindset to go in here and change the public configuration for the remote assistance, that's smart. Also really like the fact that we have take a test on here. So take a test is basically a application that's really designed for schools to allow students to connect to the internet that it doesn't allow private or sharing or ads or anything in the actual browser configuration itself. It's super secure, super vanilla, and it's dope that it's actually included in this operating system. So as we scroll through here, we'll also see that Wi-Fi direct network discovery is set for public. So that's helpful to find things if you take it, say it's on a laptop and you take a machine out to like a Starbucks or something, you wanna find a public Wi-Fi, that's perfect. You don't wanna have that on on your private network. So again, somebody was in here that knew what the hell they were doing and actually configured this correctly. And these are things that show, I mean, that you know, you gotta understand that when you're in the systems engineering role and you're going for a, uh, a level of security in an operating system, any of these little things, these little nitpick things that I'm pointing out, the only reason I'm pointing them out is as a systems engineer that is, is basically focused on detail, when you see these things, you question, okay, well, why is that like that? You know, because we all know in the field that you shouldn't have things publicly accessible to a machine. And then when you're on your private network, you don't want to allow certain functions for public connections on your internal LAN. So the fact that that's set up like that tells me that the person that set this up, they, they have an understanding as to what they were doing. They knew what they were doing to secure the operating system. So before we go even further into this, when we start to do our Nessus scan, I'm going to tell you right away that I have a feeling this is going to do real well. I have a feeling that it's going to come back with no issues whatsoever. That's my guess here, just because we have an operating system that's fully up to date. Uh, we have an operating system that has uh, the IEAC 001 control on here for the uh, security configuration of the firewall. Uh, we have the um, the test um, the test uh, configuration here for our um, our take a test configuration for our browser configuration for website access to the internet. These are things that you don't typically get out of the box. Uh, we have a worker school account configuration again to allow you to uh, create and connect. I don't know, just things in here to me look like we have an operating system that somebody put some effort and some thought into. So I'm excited to see how this does. Okay, so now that we've looked at the firewall configuration, let's take a look at our Windows updates. Um, we're gonna do this through command line just because typically when I do it through the GUI, we don't see anything. So might as well do it through the command line. So right now we're actually only showing that we have three updates installed. Now on this particular machine, as you can see, I, I have six gigs allocated of roughly six gigs of allocated memory to this machine. Um, and we're only using 900 megs of page file, but 900 megs of page file, keep that in mind, the, op, the, the disk says we're at 5.2 gigs, but it apparently about a gig of that is my page file. So really the operating system is probably closer to 5.1 or five gigs of actual drive space used which is genuinely impressive for a system like this, for something that has these updates. So let's uh, put a static IP address on this thing and let's scan it with our Nessus scanner and see what we get back. Now, I have a feeling we'll still get the uh, vulnerability error back from the 23H2 that exists in the out of the box ISO configuration. So without the additional registry patches on the system, chances are we'll still get that back, but let's run the scan anyway as it is and if we get that back, then what I'll do is I'll just put together that package for my uh, registry modifications on this system to patch for the WannaCry bug uh, garbage that Microsoft decided to give us back for our operating system. And then let's, uh, let's run the scan again afterwards and see if we lock down this operating system. And much like all of my videos to run the scan, generally speaking, what I do is I disable the firewall. So let's disable the firewall on Windows 11 first. So we have our Windows firewall turned off. 
Uh, okay, so let's uh, jump over to our Tenable system and scan this thing. Okay, guys, so we're back on the Tenable scanner now. And I ran two different scans here. I, I figured I would save us the time. The first scan I ran was just the straight-up penetration test with the, um, with the vulnerability we know already exists. It came back with 65 infos and one medium. The one medium is still the SMB signing not required issue. Uh, we're aware of that. And then we have the 65 infos. Perhaps not surprisingly, system did really well. Let's take a look at the other scan while we're at it. So if we take a look at the post configuration fix, this is after we do put in place the registry modification to take care of the SMB signing. And as you can see, it's gone. Something to keep in mind is I did scan this in addition for the log4j vulnerability to see if that start menu object had it and it does not. So we're in good shape there. I would say at this point, I would call this a really secure operating system. Once I put the firewall on, then obviously none of this shows up. But um, I would say out of the box, this is probably the most or one of one of the most secure Windows 11 tiny operating systems I've seen uh, and probably the most beneficially packaged, probably the best packaged uh, Windows 11 Tiny Edition that I've seen, especially since it doesn't require the Trusted Platform module, which really opens the ability to run this operating system up for older hardware. I'll put the link in the description. Definitely give these guys some love. Uh, they did a fantastic job developing this operating system, especially from a security standpoint. I'd like to give the uh, dev a high five, whoever that guy is that went into the firewall and took those additional steps to give us some security in the operating system. Cheers to that guy. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Take care now.